Principles of Non-Union Management. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. These slides are by Dr. Spence Reed and Dr. Henry Boateng at Hershey Medical Center, and I am Saka Brahman narrating these. So non-unions present in a wide spectrum. So we're going to seek to find the principles of treatment for all these different cases and scenarios. So we'll talk about the incidence and impact of non-unions a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about factors that predispose a patient to non-union, including systemic factors that can include endocrine, um, smoking factors, medications. Uh, there are also local factors uh, like infection and uh, vascular compromise that can predispose to non-union. Uh, there are also mechanical factors, and uh, we'll focus a little bit talking about strain theory. And uh, that'll comprise most of this first uh, video. And in the next couple of videos from the slide deck, we'll talk more about deformity, bone loss, and approaches to management. So when is it a non-union? Uh, well, it's a radiographic and a clinical diagnosis. It's when you have non-progression towards radiographic union over multiple points of evaluation, and it's usually accompanied by non-improving clinical progression. The patient continues to have pain, is not making progress, and then at some point you may see broken or failing hardware uh, because it mechanically uh, has lost the race to bone healing. Uh, so here's an example of distal tibia fracture treated with open reduction and internal fixation after five months. Uh, you can see persistent fracture line. You can see some loss of fixation. And uh, you can presume that uh, you're going on to non-union here. So let's talk about the incidence and cost of tibial non-union. So we we'll use the tibia as an example. So in this uh, particular series, 12% non-union uh, in uh, tibia fractures, 87% uh, likelihood of that being an open fracture. Uh, and um, it, this is very costly, right? I mean, like, look at uh, well, you know, what you're talking about when you have to treat a non-union. Uh, the patients tend to be on opioids for a longer period of time. Uh, they're having multiple procedures. So certainly there's a um, health system cost as well as a... Uh, or cost to the patient themselves, uh, both monetarily and uh, in their time and uh, quality of life. So here's a study uh, by Dr. Brinker looking at uh, 237 tibial non-unions over 10-year period and um, severe impacts right on uh, standardized uh, patient outcome scores, such as the SF12 physical component scores, ALS lower limb core score, SF12 mental component, Score. So this is something that's devastating to patients' physical and mental health and um, has been found even to be more severe than uh, cardiovascular disease. And um, I think as a health, health systems really don't think about that. Um, these are somewhat infrequent compared to things like cardiac disease, but the quality of life impact can be severe or, or more severe. So um, you should consider, of course, getting radiographs. And if you're thinking non-union, you should also consider getting CT scan images. And these can sometimes be surprising uh, in your workup. Uh, occasionally, when you think something's healing and you get a CT scan, you find out you really don't have bridging bone. And sometimes implants and uh, radiographic projections can make it hard to really fully assess uh, whether something's healed or not. Good history and exam can help. Uh, you know, ongoing pain, uh, lack of progression with um, physical function. And uh, you should focus on correctable comorbidities uh, and things like smoking, for instance, and ask the question, could this be infected? Uh, and that can be a hard diagnosis to make uh, in the absence of frank you know, drainage and obvious acute components of infection. So when working up a patient, uh, Dr. Brinker, in the uh, reference below, uh, says you should consider a uh, laboratory evaluation, including things like CBC, ESR, CRP, um, endocrinologic labs such as TSH, PTH, vitamin D, uh, testosterone, and uh, other chemistries like uh, albumin, prealbumin, uh, and uh, consider getting a hemoglobin A1C. So an endocrine evaluation 
um, if you find abnormalities might be helpful because sometimes you have an unexplained non-union and they have a new endocrinologic diagnosis the patient was unaware of and may have declared itself through the non-union, uh, vitamin D deficiency, thyroid abnormalities, central uh, hypogonadism, uh, should be uh, treated if uh, discovered during your workup. And in some patients, Dr. Brinker mentions here, 25% healed with medical treatment alone. So you really should work these patients up. They should be treated concomitantly. And uh, oftentimes, once you correct that, the fracture might go on to heal. And certainly, if you're going to do surgical correction, you want to make sure you've covered all your bases and given the patient the best chance to heal. Hyperparathyroidism is an unexplained uh, it is something that can uh, present itself in an unexplained non-union where you otherwise are not convinced there's infection and there's no other, you think it's been fixed well, for example. Um, so in tibial non-union, uh, prevalence is fairly high. Uh, as another uh, thing, severe uh, vitamin D deficiency can present a secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, so this is something to consider. What about NSAIDs? So um, the use of NSAIDs in the early post-op period could increase your or chance of fracture healing, right? You have an inflammatory phase of fracture healing, and um, this could potentially impact this. It's a controversial topic at the present because we're really trying to utilize more NSAIDs as part of multimodal pain management. Uh, to avoid um, chronic opioid dependence and addiction. Um, so it's possible this could increase the rate of non-unions, although we don't have great evidence for that yet. Um, I think what you could probably consider is that if you're treating a non-union, you may want to avoid uh, excessive use of NSAIDs. What about smoking? Well, um, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, smoking can increase the risk of non-union, uh, it might also be true for marijuana smoke. Um, so uh, when treating a tibia fracture, it can, uh, you know, smoking cessation um, it is important to consider. Um, if you have a patient who's not progressing with healing, you really may want to uh, ask them about um, seriously considering um, quitting smoking at this time. Sometimes this is an opportune uh, moment to uh, help a patient in many ways. Um, so, you know, you may have to really ask. You may have to take a proactive uh, stance in maybe helping them uh, quit. Uh, Chantix is an FDA-approved uh, uh, medication to help with smoking cessation. It, uh, it can really work, but the patient really has to be convinced that they want to quit smoking. So, as I mentioned earlier, you really want to correct as many factors as possible uh, prior to additional surgery. So uh, if your lab worked up, revealed that they have low vitamin D levels, you should correct that. Try to get them to quit smoking. Glucose control uh, is important. Local tissue issues, for instance, uh, you may need to get a plastic surgeon involved uh, for coverage problems uh, and optimizing their medication. So... Um, if you have a patient that truly exceeds, exceeds your skill set, you may have to refer that patient. So things to think about in your checklist for non-union include uh, malalignment, broken hardware, are there uh, biologic um, systemic things? You know, we talked about some of these already. Are there local things, tissue problems, for example? Um, is there a lack of mechanical stability? Is there infection? Do you have bone loss? Uh, do you need to have some type of soft tissue coverage? These are all the different things that may have to be incorporated uh, in part of your um, in your in your treatment uh, for non-union. So to understand non-unions, let's talk about strain a little bit, right? So here is an example of some uh, tibia non-unions, and um, what is strain? Well, it's how a material responds to loading by deforming. So if you have a um, uh, material by this fixed length, and then you increase it, right? So you go from uh, this length now out to this length. Well, um, strain is defined by the delta L, or you know your um, change in length, essentially, over the length, right? So that's 
that's axial strain, right, shown here. Uh, so you can also have shear strain, right? So here you can see um, by applying shear forces, that change in length over the length is your shear strain. So shear strain can occur uh, both uh, from translation and torsional strain, as shown here. And uh, we'll show those in some clinical examples as well. So why is it a problem? Well, here you can see some translation, translational strain, right? And here you can see torsional strain. So in the you know, and you can see you know on the left, the fracture is not fixed. Uh, there's no you know not, perhaps not enough stability. And there's some um, translational strain there. And here you can see sort of an unlocked uh, intramedullary fixation of um, this diaphyseal fracture. And uh, perhaps that's allowing for torsional strain. And what you can see there is a sort of hypertrophic nonunion. This is a difficult concept to understand. But um, let's think of it this way. You have a boy who's uh, looking at a boat, right? And uh, that boat is 100 meters away, uh, let's say that is basically your fracture gap, right? And that boat's bobbing up and down in the water, you know, one meter, right? So that boy's hand, as he points to the boat bobbing up and down, it's going to really, you know, go up and down for a very short distance, right? Or if he had, let's say, if his, you know, if he was holding on to a rope tied to the front of the boat, and that boat is going up and down one meter, he's really going to notice very little difference in that rope going up and down. So that's shear strain delta L over L. So that's the delta L is 1. It's over an L of 100. So it's a 1% shear strain. Now let's say that the boy is a lot closer to the boat, right? And now that distance is 1 meter, but the boat's still bobbing up and down in the water, 1 meter up and down. Well, now you can imagine you know, that boy's hand, or let's say he's holding on to the rope, okay, that rope is going way up and down in his hand, and your strain is now 100%, right? Um, so imagine that the rope he's holding on to is a fragile capillary, right, across a fracture gap. So you clearly want a low-strain environment, um, to stabilize, uh, you know, your capillary and not uh, not avoid uh, a disruptive situation. So, uh, Dr. Stephen Perrin at uh, the AO um, Institute really uh, is the main uh, researcher behind the interfragmentary strain theory. So, here's the, one of the original references, and what he stated is that a tissue cannot survive in an environment that exceeds its strain tolerance. And for granulation tissue, it's a hundred percent. In cartilage, it's 10%. And if you really want to develop bone, you have to have a strain of as low as 2%. So that's the strain tolerance. So each tissue prepares the local environment biologically and mechanically for the next tissue. And you can see this progression from left to right where you're forming bone. So you get granulation tissue that hopefully helps the callus stiffen to decrease interfragmentary motion. And that's usually 10 to 50% which hopefully then will get you to the point where you can then um, form cartilage and then eventually bone and then eventually a healed fracture. So what's the oxygen tension in an osteocyte in the middle of your tibia? Well, it's about 100 millimeters mercury, same as arterial blood. So, you know, bone is a very aerobic tissue and requires an intact capillary network to survive. So... My, you know, microscopically, this is what you're looking at. Bone cannot exist in a region of high strain. It's got to be 2% at least or lower because the capillary network to, to support the bone can't survive. So you need precursor tissues to create a, an environment stable enough for that capillary network to form. And those capillaries need low strain. So bone needs a capillary network. Capillaries need low strain. Um, so, and you need bridging capillaries across this fracture gap to get fracture union. So this is where compression can help, right? So compression is a very efficient way to control shear strain through friction and interdigitation. And, uh, then you really don't need those intermediate tissues. You just get direct, uh, primary bone healing, right? If you remember your, um, 
your sort of uh, AO uh, compression uh, theories. So to obtain union, the implant and the callus together has to control motion at the fracture gap such that capillaries can start to be, you know, begin to cross over. Uh, you have to control torsional and, and, and translational shear strain, which is the most difficult. Uh, and uh, as you can see, a situation like this is revised uh, to uh, more stable fixation. You can see there's a lag screw compression across this. Uh, in order to obtain union. Alignment also helps to normalize forces and reduce strain. Distraction, to some extent, actually widens the gap and, if you think about it, can decrease strain uh, in that way. So, you have to think about how does distraction, how does realignment affect shear strain? So ultimately, if you're presented with a non-union, these are the questions you want to think about. What tissues are in the fracture gap? What's the strain in the fracture gap? Can the local tissue undergo metaplasia if strain is controlled? And if not, is biologic augmentation, like bone grafting, needed to allow the creation of callus? Um, if necessary, you have to make sure you restore axial alignment, control translation and translational and torsional strain. So we're going to pause here, and we'll pick up with the uh, next video uh, uh, the next portion of this uh, slide deck. Thanks.